Give me a minute. I need a minute. I might need two. It's always very emotional when I come back to Wangarei. So many new faces. There's still a few old ones, Jan. Still a few. And art thou come again, O night? I know thee by thy starry crown. And by the mists of violent light which gather where thy robes fall down. I know thee by the purple clouds, thy strong wings spread around the moon. And by the stillness which enshrouds thy presence, thou art come too soon. Too soon, for lo, thy fair love sleep turns not her sweet face to the skies. She lingers where the shadows creep and stays to kiss our children's eyes. But when her gentle hands have blessed our homestead, she will come to thee. And through the holy hours of rest, thine arms will hold her safe and she We'll hear the promises again thou bringest from the distant spheres and learn the reason of our pain, the meaning of our bitter tears. Thine eyes are steadfast and I dare their mighty mystery to read. But mine are dimmed by thought and care and fall, fail me in my greatest need I watch for thee, will thou not bring a message to my fainting heart? Through the summer time and snow and spring, I watch for thee, must thou depart? Thus silently, when will it come? That perfect day which we await. For us thy lips are ever dumb. And voiceless is thy calm estate. Ah, tell me thy fair love sleep, that she may touch me when she passes by and whisper what she hears from thee in some sweet lullaby. I want to share with you a passage of scripture from John's Gospel, chapter 3. And if you'd like to turn with me, we'll read these uh, verses. It's a familiar story, but I hope I will be able to provide with you, you with some fresh insight into that story this morning. It is the story, of course, of Nicodemus, who came to see Jesus by night. John chapter 3, reading from verse 1. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. And Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, Verily I tell you, 
No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. The night. Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the night. It's a strange time, the night, isn't it? I remember when I was a, a young guy and we, we lived seven or eight miles out of the centre of Perth. It was a gravel road and we lived towards the end, a dead end gravel road and we lived towards the end of the road and there were no street lights. The nearest street light was down at the corner about four or five hundred metres away. And the further away you got from the corner, the less light there was. And you know, when you're a child or perhaps just not quite a, a young person but just coming out of childhood and you know, there's, it's, it's amongst the scrub, the bush and the, uh, the shadows from the distant light seemed to cast an, an eerie, scary sort of a shadow. And you make your way and you're not certain as to what's next. You hear a sound. Is it a frightening sound? You make your way home, finally to reach your destination. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and I wonder if there isn't something more here for us than at first meets the eye. I wonder if in a sense if we don't all come to Jesus by night. I hope you'll understand what I mean by the time we've finished our time together. Some have said that Nicodemus was hiding in the darkness. He was embarrassed, and perhaps he was. May well have been. He was scared and didn't want to be seen or caught. And perhaps there's quite a deal of truth in that. Others have said that Nicodemus wasn't a true believer and that his faith was shallow and superficial. Few have even said that it was just a matter of scheduling and night was the only time that Nicodemus and Jesus could get together. Maybe. Perhaps all of these are to some degree true. But I think that there is something much more important here than we at first see. And I believe that John is using this idea of night in a particular way. Not in our usual understanding of the word. John is using it to describe a condition or a circumstance. You see, there was the daytime Nicodemus. And the daytime Nicodemus was in control. The daytime Nicodemus knew exactly what had to be done. He knew who had to be seen, where he had to go, what tasks had to be performed, and he knew what to do. Oh, a bit like you and me, eh? During the daytime, we see the task at hand. We know what we have to do. We're in control. We've got our fingers on the pulse. We know where we're going. But at night time, we may not be quite so certain. We not, may not be able to see just exactly where the next step is going to be. We may not be able to predict what the outcome is going to be of our next action. Our usual daytime activities have no power or meaning in the night. We are unable to create and sustain our own life in the night, perhaps because of exhaustion, perhaps because of lack of illumination, perhaps because of lack of resources or something else. 
We're not don't have that same level of control. And so John's account of the gospel night is a time described by Jesus when no man can work. Chapter 9 and verse 4. Elsewhere, Jesus speaks of the night as the time when we stumble because there is no light in us and we just can't see the way forward in John in chapter 11 and verse 10. Encountering the unknown, as much as we may wish to deny it, the unknown means a lot of important things. Stuff that you and I don't understand, don't comprehend. Have you ever woken up in the early hours of the morning, in the wee small hours, 2 a.m., and lay there in bed and had something trouble you? Wondered what the answer was? Where the next step? Where does wisdom lay? What will I do now? How will I satisfy all sides? Or does it never bother you? Do you never have any troubles that come to your mind in the midst of the night? Ah, uh, my friends, no troubles? That's not what Jesus said would be the case for his followers. Night is the separation, the fragmentation and division within us that can become a betrayal of ourselves and others. Do you remember Judas? When John describes what happens at the Last Supper, he says he got up and he says he left the table and he, added, he adds these words, and it was night. And it was night. Reflection does not always lead to regeneration. Sometimes when we, we can withdraw, and our night time doesn't have to be at midnight, it can be at midday. Night time is about not what time it is on the clock. Night time is about what time it is here or here. Night time is what's going on for me, inside of me. Where do I find myself? Where do I see myself? And it doesn't always work out good. Sometimes we, uh, we resort to the night time and the reflection does not mean that we see wisdom, but the reflection means that paranoia takes over. Do you suffer from paranoia? You don't have to answer. I'll be, I'll, I'll be courageous. I don't have to say any more, do I? The paranoia, the suspicion, the suspicion, the world is against me, God has abandoned me. But do you know, friends, that God never, ever abandons you? Do you know that? God never, ever abandons you. God has made a covenant with his people and he is faithful to the covenant forever. It was Israel who walked out on God. God never walked out on Israel. Never. God is faithful for what he has promised. Night describes those times when we fish all night and catch nothing. Now I know that over the years there have been a few fishermen in the Bongaroi church. And if they ever fished all night and caught nothing, I'll guarantee they never told you about it. I made sure they got home late after the fish shop had opened. 
But the night describes those times when we fish all night but catch nothing. Our efforts, unfortunately, prove fruitless. And our nets remain empty. A time when we recognise a need for renewal and hope. Do you know that the worst thing that could ever happen to the human race is that we would live lives of unbridled success? Do you realise that would be the worst thing that could happen? Unbridled success. I want to ask you this. Have you ever had a failure in your life? Have you ever had success in your life? How much do you learn from success? Very little, if anything. Very little, if anything. You learn from failure and how to deal with failure and how to manage it That's where you learn. God teaches us in the darkness of our experience. God allows these things to come to us, to show us the way home. Coming to Jesus by night is not a statement about the time. Nicodemus' motive or his faith, it is rather a description of Nicodemus and his life, a description that probably fits all of us at one time or another. Coming by night is the recognition that there is a daytime. A daytime Nicodemus and a nighttime Nicodemus. A daytime Mary, a nighttime Mary. A daytime Bill, a nighttime Bill. The daytime is when I'm in control and I'm calling the shots, buddy. I'm calling the shots. And the night time is a realisation that I don't know, got no idea about the shots. And I'm flailing, struggling, trying to find the way forward, the next step. As I lift my heart and my voice to heaven. By day Nicodemus knows who he is, he has an identity, he's a Pharisee. He has a role and a reputation as a leader of the Jews. He knows and applies the law and he knows what's about. People listen to him. They respect him and they follow him. He has a particular place in society. He fits in. He has security and power. But by night time, not so sure. Not so sure. By night, however, Nicodemus is lost and confused. He cannot see or understand. It's not that he doesn't want to, but nothing makes sense. He's overwhelmed by his circumstance. He's in the dark, as we say. His work, his accomplishments and his reputation seem to count for nothing. His place in society no longer provides stability or answers. Everything has changed. He's stumbling in the dark. Daytime certainty has given way to nighttime questions. And so he asks the questions of Jesus. When Jesus says to him, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And he turns to the master and he says to him, in his confusion, he says, how can these things be? The teacher In Israel, how can these things be? By day he keeps the faith. By night, however, his nets come up empty. He's looking for something. Something the daytime life just cannot give him. Not in his control. Not under his his finger, looking for that pulse. 
We probably all know what it's like if we're honest. We live daytime lives and we live nighttime lives. It's got nothing to do whether it's daytime or nighttime. But the daytime life, all is well. We live with a sense of identity and security. We have place and purpose. Our life has meaning and predictability. Our family depends on us and they depend upon us reliably. Our life has meaning and direction. Daytime reveals what is, but darkness reveals nothing. By night, everything is hidden. We stumble through the darkness. Isn't it interesting, my friends, that when Jesus goes to pay the ultimate price, he goes to Gethsemane and it is night time. As he struggles there with the evil one, it's in the night time. As he purchases for you and for me eternal salvation, He's reaching out. He says to his father, if it be possible, what? Let this cup pass from me. Let it pass from me. We're almost always better at daytime living than nighttime living. We've been taught to live daytime lives. That's what our world values, encourages and rewards. Living by bread alone. And the more of it, the better. We want to be daytime people. That means we spend our time looking for information and answers. We build our reputations. We desire recognition and approval. We establish our place in life. We buy stuff and we gain wealth, prestige and power. Well, that's not much power. We want predictability and control. We prefer what is safe and familiar. But I want to suggest to you that a time comes to all of us when safety and predictability will not be available. And we will have to live by faith as we have never lived by faith before. And if we have not learned to do it while we are running with the footmen, we will certainly not be able to do it in the time of the chariots. Daytime life is the life we create for ourselves. I have to say that inherently there's nothing necessarily wrong with the daytime living. We all do it and we need to do it. And in a sense, we have a responsibility to do it. Our families depend on it. Our neighbours, our employers or our employees depend upon it. Some of these things are necessary. The problem can be that the daytime living keeps us stuck in the cycle of always having to create and recreate our lives. Somehow we can never get enough. We never quite get there. It reminds me of a friend I had and uh, He was a pastor down in Wellington 40 years ago. (laughs) 40 years ago. And uh, I guess he and his wife and I and my wife were struggling along on our pay. uh, But, you know, in many respects I look back and I think that we were never so rich. We were never so rich. We were so dependent upon our Heavenly Father. But anyway, I remember him telling me the story that he'd been, he'd been into Wellington and he'd been past this, uh, this hi-fi shop. Now, I don't know if it's the same today, but back in those days, it was the latest sound equipment was really something. You know, you want, you want to have a good sound system. And he used to walk past this hi-fi shop and he saw this hi-fi set there. And, and he said, I have to admit, he says, I broke the ten command, tenth commandment, he said. He said, I used to walk past her office. He said, I, I, I coveted that. He said, 
And not only do I cover it, but inside do I save for it. It says, I'll put a few, away, a few dollars here, a few dollars there. Gradually, he said, bank balance mounted up. He said, finally, he said, I had enough money that I could buy this hi-fi set. So he says, I went in, gave them the money, bought the hi-fi set, took it home, set it up. He said, a fortnight later, I took it back. I said, why did you take it back? He said, the pleasure was all in the anticipation. It was all in the anticipation. But it, 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 it reminded me of a, a problem that we all face, is that there's never enough. We always want something else. But Jesus says, the only thing that will ever satisfy you is if you are born again. That's the only thing that will satisfy. Born again. Now, I don't want to discourage you from your, your day-by-day -day work. <laughs> I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to all become hippies. But I do want you to, to just sort of reflect on how much the devil has been successful in preoccupying us with things that actually are relatively unimportant. They don't matter. You can't take them with you. And in fact, in terms of where you hope to go, you wouldn't want to take them with you. They'll be unwelcome. They'll give you diddly squat for them in heaven anyway. It crowds out things. It's like that beast... For those of you of a prophetic nature, in the book of Revelation, in chapter 13, and this is John writing again, you see, and he's very cryptic in what he's writing. I, I mentioned before about the, the fishing at night and coming up empty. And you know, in the, uh, the last chapter of the Gospel of John, there's, a, there's an account of this. The disciples come in and they're empty. And Jesus is on the shore and he, he calls out to them and he said, Well, how did it go? Empty, got nothing. So what does Jesus say to them? Throw your net on the other side of the boat. So they throw down the net and they can hardly hang on to it. And they finally get into shore. And John records this, you know, my friends. And he, he tells the story and Jesus is there on the shore. And they, they bring in the net and they bring in all of these fish there. And uh, there they are, they've got all these fish. And you know, John records for us how many fish were in the net. Do you remember what it says? 153. Who said that? 153. 153 fish. Do you know what the usual practice was when these fishermen got together and they went out and they fished and they caught the fish and they brought them in? What did they do? They split them up, didn't they? Equal share. How many fishermen were there? There were seven. There were seven fishermen. So if you divide seven into 153, what do you get? Well, oh, this is going to test the mathematicians, isn't it? All right. What do you get? You get almost 22. You get almost 22 because you've got 153 fish. If you had 154 fish, you'd have an equal split everywhere. But there's only 153 fish. Is that right? There's only 153 fish? No. No. What was Jesus doing? He was cooking a fish on the, over the fire. There were 154. And my friends, I believe John, one of the things that the Spirit led John to say is that the, the, there's, there's no completeness. There's no completeness in life without Jesus. With him, there's 154 fish, 22 split seven ways. We never quite get there. It seems that which we most want is always just beyond our grasp. 
That's important information to know. It means we cannot keep doing the same old things and expect different results. You know, if you do something and, and it doesn't work and you keep doing the same thing and you keep doing it over and over and you keep doing it the same way, well, I know the farmers here would say, well, you, you're a mug. You've got to do it. You've got to find a new way to do things. You've got to find a fresh approach. It's not working. Don't you understand? It means no matter how hard we try, how much we gather or how much we know, something will always be missing from our daytime life. It will always be less than the life God intends and desires for us. No one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Moody preached a sermon and as the congregation were coming out, one of the ladies said to him, she said, she said, Brother Moody, she said, you preached that sermon before. She, he said, what do you mean? She said, you're always telling us that we need to be born again. She says, why do you tell us we have to be born again every time you preach? And there was a moment of silence. And then Moody turned to her and he says, because you must. You must. Doesn't matter what you know. Doesn't matter what you know. But if you don't know, you don't know him, it's worthless. All the knowledge in the world. No one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born again. No matter how full, beautiful or successful daytime life is, it will always be incomplete, fragile and fleeting. How could it not be? It's the life that we have created for ourselves. And what is born of the flesh is flesh. When we realise that about ourselves and our life, then we have entered the nighttime life. And here's the irony. The very life we create for ourselves often becomes the circumstance that takes us into the darkness, into Gethsemane. We keep doing the same old thing, but nothing changes. We're so exhausted. We can't muster the energy to recreate our life one more time. We have everything we want. Everything is fine. But still, something is lacking. Those and a thousand others like them are the start of our darkness. Most of us do whatever we can to avoid or get out of the darkness. Nighttime living isn't much fun, we think. It's difficult, uncomfortable, even painful. It's not our first choice. It is, however, necessary. That's why we are marked with ashes and reminded of our mortality. We must remember that what is born of the flesh is flesh and that there is more to us and our lives than what we can create for ourselves. It's why a season of fasting focuses on the very opposite of daytime living. Letting go instead of possessing. Giving out instead of grabbing in. The great temptation in the night time is to think that we just, if we just get the answer, get the right answer, if we can understand and explain it all, then we'll know what to do. We'll do it better this time. If only we can get that little bit of missing information. Things will change. We'll get what we want. And that's what Nicodemus is saying when he says, how can these things be? He wants an answer. He wants some information. That's just more daytime living. And it doesn't work in the nighttime life. The nighttime life is not a situation to be resolved, a problem to be figured out, or a question to be answered. As difficult and painful as it may be, the nighttime life is the womb by which we are born from above. It is the discomfort of the darkness. The discomforts of the darkness are the contractions by which we are pushed out into new life and born again. The nighttime birth changes everything about our daytime life. This second birth gives meaning to, completes, 
and fulfills our first birth. And without it, the first birth is utterly in vain. This, however, my friends, is the work of the Spirit. The wind bloweth where it listeth. It is the work of the Spirit. It is not our work. We cannot birth ourselves, though most of us would if we could. We cannot birth ourselves. We can only feel and give way to the rhythm of the contractions. So don't flee God's darkness. Don't flee his night. Do not flee your Gethsemane. Gethsemane. Let yourself be born. The contractions of the darkness are God's reshaping, forming, moulding you in the likeness of Jesus. And isn't that what we really want? Isn't that what we've been praying for all of our lives? Isn't that the reason we came here today? Isn't that what this Holy Sabbath day is all about? Sabbath is our reminder that the night time of life, no matter how dark, is always filled with the promise of new life, full life, abundant life, God's own life, what Jesus calls eternal life. Why settle for recreating ourselves one more time when Jesus is dying and has died to give us a life we could never create? for ourselves help us to be as Jacob who wrestled with you at the brook Jabbok may we learn to wrestle with our heavenly father may we learn to receive the blessings that heaven would give us and one day we will see that what seems to be difficult, what seems to be painful, is indeed our salvation. It is our joy and it is our all. Be near to every head bowed here. Bless us as we leave this sanctuary today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.